Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you right up front for joining us on the video and those that are here. Thank everybody. Today is uh, Saturday, the Sabbath, our normal weekly Sabbath, but it's also the day that we're going to observe Passover, Pesach. And uh, so uh, today uh, I, we're going to try to go through our normal study. We're still in Jeremiah and we'll go ahead and study in Jeremiah and we'll just add some uh, Passover stuff in. I'll probably talk about Passover and stuff like that up front, and then we'll get into our study. So, uh, but anyway, first thing, let's go to Yahuwah in prayer and just ask him to bless this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do and the many blessings that you give us. Father, we thank you for your Moedim, your feast days, your appointed times. And Father, we just ask that in our futile way, we ask that what we do and what we say would be to glorify and to magnify you and, and you alone. Father, we may not have it exactly right. We may not have the day exactly right. But Father, I just ask that you continue to work in our hearts and our lives and show us your way that you want it done. And Father, we ask that, that however we do it, that it doesn't offend you, that, uh, that you would show us your truth and help us to be what you call us to be. Father, we ask that you, through our study, that you give us your wisdom in, in our study. Father, help us to, to gain that wisdom so that we can understand, that we can walk in what you give us. And Father, we'll give you the praise and the glory for it's in Yahushua's name we pray, amen. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that, that you find in scripture is, you know, Yahuwah conceals things from people. And the reason is because he doesn't want his way of doing things defiled by Gentile people that don't know what they're doing or don't not necessarily don't know what they're doing. They don't know, but they don't care. They want to do things their way and not Yahuwah's way. And so, you know, it's like, you know, if you had a birthday party and, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want people that you don't know coming to your birthday party. You just, I mean, you just, you want people that, uh, you know, that, that are close to you, your friend, close relatives or close, you know, close friends. Well, you, who is a lot the same way he, but he, he doesn't want people to defile his feast days, his Moedim. So he's hidden a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the he's confounded the days, the calendar. So that uh, that a lot of people, you know, we, we none of us really know. You know, we don't really know what day. The uh, well, according to scripture, we know the day. We know that that we're supposed to observe Passover in the first month on the fourteenth day of the month, and then unleavened bread from the fourteenth through what the twenty third, I think, and then wherever first fruits falls out. It'd be the first day of the week during that Passover, or that unle uh, unleavened bread week, the first day of the week being Sunday. And so uh, anyway, we uh, we do our best at trying to figure it out. I think it's, uh, is it Proverbs? I think it says that, you know, it's a glory unto Yahuwah to conceal a matter and it's the glory unto the kings or the people to figure it out or try to figure it out. Well, I think that's what he wants us to do is to try to figure it out. And so, you know, we do our best to study and try to, you know, we try to look at the information that he gives us and we try to figure out exactly what he wants and how he wants it done. And, you know, so we're, we're like little children trying to figure out basically how to walk and how to talk and how to do things, you know, do things that, uh, that grownups do. Well, but that's, that's basically how, how we are, you know, we're trying to figure all this out. And, uh, you know, my prayer is that, uh, that he accepts accepts what you know what we try to do as long as we're trying to do the right thing you know we we know that following the torah is vital in in pleasing yahuwah and we know that uh yahusha is his messiah for us and uh and you know he is yahuwah in the flesh that in that human body he came to earth and provided a way of salvation that could only be done by Yahushua coming and shedding his blood. So 
uh, anyway, uh, we we, uh, we have that right. And but you know, finding out the, the the feast days and and exactly how to count the days and figure the days. There's a lot of different calendars out there, and uh, right now we're currently looking at uh, the uh, Michael Rood calendar, which goes by the the crescent moon in the afternoon being the first day. Uh, I'm, I've been studying the calendar and trying to figure out a lot in that calendar. And it, I don't think that that's exactly right. Personally, I think that it's the crescent moon rising in the morning. You know, so in other words, when you see the crescent moon, crescent moon rising in the east before sunrise, and then you see the crescent, and then the next day you don't see the crescent, then the following day would be the it, it, it's it's at the conjunction. The it's when the the earth, the moon, and the sun are all in alignment, and I think that that's going to be the new moon. I studied uh, the Book of Enoch today. And I mean, it's, it's terribly confusing. And even I, I read it real slow several times and tried to try to picture, you know, how he, you know, how, how he explains it, how Enoch explains it. But still, I think that after reading it, if you want to look at it, look at Enoch chapter 78 and uh, it, it about, I don't know. It depends on the version that you look at, but it's in chapter either 77 or 78, depending on which version you look at. I had both versions open at the same time trying to compare them today. But anyway, I think it's when you see the crescent moon and then the next day you don't see the moon. So you might, when you see it, it's probably at about a three or 4% illumination, maybe five. And then the next day, when you don't see it, it's probably about a 1% illumination. And so it's still there, but a lot of times you can't see it. And then the next day is the conjunction. That would be the first day of the month. And that's what I'm looking at it moving to, you know, from, you know, after we get through uh, Passover, moving to that. And what it'll do is it, if you look at Enoch, it also explains that uh, the best that I can interpret it, it, it explains that the full moon is always on the 15th day of the month. And so we know that the feast days, you know, Passover starts or Passover, uh, unleavened bread starts on the 15th day of the month. And then uh, uh, Sukkot starts on the 15th day of the month. Now, Shavuot is another one of the, the so Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot are all pilgrimage feast days. In other words, that's the days that we're supposed to go to Jerusalem or they did back in the old days. Well, when they traveled, it, they could travel and, and do things at night because there was a full moon. And I think Yahuwah created that to be that way. So when they were traveling, they could see where they're going at night. And so, you know, I think there's a purpose behind the way he does things. In fact, I know there's a purpose if, if we can just figure it out. But uh, long story short, Enoch explains that on the 15th day of the month, the moon is full, is the way that I understand it, or the way that I read it. So for that to happen, then the, the first day of the month, which would be at the, you know, the new moon, it would be at the conjunction, it's when it's dark. And so for, it, for all that to line up, then I think that that's when the new moon actually starts is at the conjunction and when you find when you see it the way the jews well they go by a calendar that's that's it's it's got an al they have an algorithm and they actually produce the calendar ahead of time so it's not based on observation but a lot of the the well the michael root calendar for instance it's based on observation but it based observation on the sighting of the of the moon when the sun is setting, not when it's rising, you know, when the, when the sun and the moon is setting, not when the sun and the moon is rising. And so uh, looking at it from that perspective, the, it's, it's like three days after the conjunction when you finally see the moon. And that puts the full moon later in the month. It puts the, fo the full moon at the 17th, 18th kind of time frame. And so 
I, I think that I think that, that that the conjunction would be the new moon. And you know, throughout history, it's been pretty much you know people have considered the conjunction or the dark moon being the new moon. And if you look on the science uh, channels on you know the computer and look at things like that, that's generally when they say. Now, I don't go by it because they say that. I go by it because I think that's what scripture says. And so anyway, uh, I don't want to bore you with all of this, but it's something that that I think we're going to try to move to. So I've, I've been looking and I actually built a calendar and it's kind of funny or strange, but uh, the Sefer calendar, uh, Stephen Pigeon's calendar is exactly the same calendar that I built. And uh, when I got to looking, uh, I, you know, I was going to try to, you know, compare my calendar with other calendars that are out there. And my calendar, the one that I actually just built from scratch, it's the same as Stephen Pigeon. So he's already got it published. And so, uh, you know, I'd like to go ahead and, you know, and maybe use his calendar from here on out. And so anyway, again, you know, right now we're on the Michael Rood calendar, uh, the one that Michael Rood put together based on the observation of the moon, the, the new moon being the crescent moon, where I think the new moon is actually the dark moon. Okay, so again, I don't want to bore you with a lot of stuff, but it, it's my efforts in trying to get our feast days on the days that Yahuwah wants us to be on. So that brings us to right now, we're according to the Michael Rood calendar, again, it's not the new calendar, but the Michael Rood calendar, we're on the first month, and that first month, we're on the uh, the 14th day of the month, which we're going to observe Passover this afternoon at even, or after the sun goes down, and then, uh, you know, we'll eat the, the Seder meal uh, later on, and uh, so anyway, starting tomorrow, we'll be observing unleavened bread for seven days, and so throughout all our house, we need to we need to cleanse our house as well as we can from the unleavened bread and just don't eat any leavened bread all week. In other words, anything that's puffed up, anything that has yeast, baking powder or baking soda or any leavening agent, we need to not eat any of that. We need to, and at the same time, we do need to eat unleavened bread. Now, the not eating of the bread is, is a commandment. But the most important thing is to understand that Yahusha is our unleavened bread and he is our Passover lamb. So when we eat the unleavened bread and drink the wine, we need to be remembering that the, the unleavened bread represents the, the sinless life that Yahusha led here on earth. The, the, the wine that we drink during the Seder is going to, you know, it represents the blood that he shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so that's what that we're supposed to be remembering. And at the same time, the another thing that we're supposed to eat is bitter herb. Now the bitter herb, it's, it can be about anything, really anything that you want, as long as it's green. Now, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Bitter herb could could possibly be lettuce. Uh, it could be parsley. It could be cilantro. I mean, if you had dandelion greens, or if you had uh, uh, turnip greens, or if you had mustard greens, or just you know any kind of bitter herb, you could go outside in the yard and pick sourdough probably, and you know, and it would it would be a bitter herb. The the scripture isn't specific in what the bitter herb actually is. Now the Jewish uh, tradition, a lot of it might be horseradish. Well, horseradish could be a bitter herb. So it, the, it, it doesn't tell exactly what is bitter herb. And, but the, the main thing is that when you eat it, the bitter herb reminds us that we are in the wilderness and that, uh, that we haven't quite got everything exactly right. So in the eyes of Yahuwah, we are bitter in a lot of cases in his eyes from a fleshly standpoint. Now, when it comes to the spiritual side, we know that, that, that the, well, even the, the fleshly and spiritual side, 
the best that we can do is filthy rags in the eyes of Yahuwah. So how do we become right standing with Yahuwah? Well, the way we do it is do we follow the Torah at the best of our ability and we accept Yahusha as Messiah. And when Yahusha's blood covers us, then Yahuwah, when he looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees Yahusha's blood. And so when he sees Yahusha's blood, we know that the death angel will pass over us. Like in Moses' day, when they were in Egypt, they, they killed the Passover lamb, and that Passover lamb was just a placeholder until the Messiah came. So they would take the blood from that Passover lamb and they put it on the doorpost of the house. And that way, when the death angel went through the neighborhood, went through that area, if there was blood on the doorpost, then the death angel passed that house up. They passed over that house. If there was no blood on the doorpost, then the death angel went in and killed the firstborn of all the people, livestock, and everything. Okay, so uh, that's where the Passover supposedly originated. Now, I'm, I make, I'm going to make a case where that's not really where it started. I think Passover actually started in the Shamaim in heaven before, even before Adam. And the reason I say that is when Adam and Eve sinned, if blood hadn't have been shed, then they could not have had their sins. There, 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 there is no remission of sins. With their, their sins could not have been atoned for. Now, when you look at that, it says that Yahuwah gave them skins to put on. Now, I think there's a case to be made that he put this, this skin, basically. He covered us with skin. But if it was an animal skin, he had to kill the animal to get the skin. So there, was, there had to be blood shed for Adam and Eve to be forgiven for their sin. So the first Passover, I think, the, the, the first Passover that included human beings was with Adam and Eve. And so, you know, I mean, if you go back and look at the feast days, that's, I think that, that all the feast days originated in heaven, in the Shamaim prior to Adam and Eve. So they were all instituted before Adam and Eve. And then when Adam and Eve come along, then it became, instead of being all spiritual, now it becomes some it becomes physical and spiritual well so the the idea is that you know when moses led the children of israel out of egypt okay it's a direct parallel to where we are today and i'll try to i'll try to you know i'll talk about it probably more tonight during our seder and i'll try to record that also but you need to see or you need to you need to envision the parallel between then and now. So Moses, they killed the Passover lamb. Well, Yahusha is our Passover lamb. He died on the cross. And so that's the parallel between the Passover lamb and Yahusha. Okay, the blood that Moses, when, when Moses uh, had the lambs killed and they put the, the blood on the doorpost, then Yahusha's blood now is on our doorpost. Now, what is our doorpost? Well, our doorpost is the doorpost to our heart. So the, the, uh, the circumcision or the, you know, the, the temple or the house or however you want to look at it is the doorway to our soul, to our spirit. And that doorway now is covered in Yahusha's blood. If we have accepted Yahusha, his sacrifice, for what he's done on the cross, then now that blood, his blood covers our doorpost. Well, our doorpost is our life, is our temple and or our ark or however you want to look at it. So anyway, now once it's covered, okay, then back in Moses' day, they led the children of Israel. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness. So he left Basically, today, what we're looking at is when we are now following the Torah and have the faith in Yahusha, then we have left Babylon, okay? The world is considered Babylon. The entire world right now is considered Babylon. So we have left Babylon. 
but we are now in the wilderness, just like Moses led the children of Israel into the wilderness. We are now in the wilderness because we're not in, uh, in the presence of Yahuwah yet. And so we're not in that promised land. Well, Moses led the children of Israel around in the desert for 40 years. And at the end of the Moses journey, Yahuwah told him that you're not going to go into the promised land. So uh, he turned the reins, the control over to Joshua, Yahusha. That's uh, Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yahusha, just like the Messiah. So uh, you got to picture this now. You've got, uh, what, you know, Moses represents the Torah. So as we're in the wilderness, we're following Moses. We're following the Torah to the best of our ability, trying to do the everything that the Torah tells us to do. Now, the Torah can lead us up to the promised land. Moses led the children of Israel up to the promised land. But the Torah can't take us in. Moses could not take the children of, of Israel into the promised land. It takes Joshua, Yahusha, to get you into the promised land. Okay, so the... The whole analogy of Moses and Egypt and the wilderness and Joshua is all played out the second time in the physical again with Yahusha leading us into the promised land. And so uh, from a spiritual standpoint now, we are, we're in the wilderness, we're being led around by Moses, the Torah, and it's going to take Yahusha, Yahusha the Messiah to get us into the promised land. And I know a lot of the theologians, the, the doctors of theology, they have no idea of what I just said. I mean, they've never put that together. In fact, when, uh, when I tell people that like in, in modern day Christianity, that parallel or that analogy or however you want to look at it, they look at me like, wow, I've never thought of that or never heard that. Well, it's because they've never, Yahuwah's just not showing them. And so uh, it's just, it's one of the great mysteries that uh, Yahuwah's put together. And so, you know, the whole dying on the cross, and I mean, there's, there's, there's reasons behind it that are never taught in modern day Christianity because they just don't know. They don't understand the, the Hebrew meaning and understanding and, and why things are done the way they are. So anyway, long story short, uh, Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits are right here. We're, we're entering into all of these. And then in 50 days after Passover, or I'm sorry, after first fruits, we'll uh, observe Shavuot, which is Shavuot is the day of the covenant. And so we also know that uh, from the historical side, if you go into some of the external books, you can actually see where, uh, Abraham cut the covenant with Yahuwah, or Yahuwah cut the covenant with Abraham, however you want to look at it, on Shavuot, whenever Abraham slaughtered the animals, cut them in two, and Yahuwah passed between them. Uh, that was on Shavuot. Uh, when, uh, uh, before that, when uh, Noah made the covenant with Yahuwah on the rainbow, that was on Shavuot. When Adam made the covenant with Yahuwah, the Adamic, the Adamic covenant, that was made on Shavuot. And then when Moses come along, Moses uh, went up on the mountain and received the Torah, the law, on Shavuot. And then when the, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, when it fell on the assembly 50 days after Yahushua's crucifixion, that was on Shavuot. So, and, and most people don't know that, but all the, all the biblical covenants were cut on Shavuot. And again, it's one of those things that, uh, that people that don't know, they have no idea. They think, a lot of the, the Christians think, that uh, the first Shavuot or the first uh, Pentecost was actually 50 days after the crucifixion or the first day of first fruits. They don't even, you know, they, they think that that was the very first one. It's when the Holy Spirit came. Well, that, it, there was all the covenants of the scripture. Were, were cut on Shavuot. Shavuot is the day of covenants. And so anyway, there's a, there's a lot in the, the understanding of the scripture that's basically hidden from 
the modern day churches. And until they really get on board and start following the Torah, they'll never know that all that stuff exists. Now they may be told, you know, we could tell them, but uh, it won't mean anything to them because it's not their, uh, their cemetery trained uh, pastors that go to the, you know, up to their, to their seminaries, their cemeteries or however you want to call it. And so, you know, uh, if, if you're not a, if you're not a degreed, uh, theologian from that have a doctorate degree from those seminaries then they look at you like you know uh, you just don't know you're you know you're well you, they don't they don't they don't believe us anyway long story short uh i would much rather be ruach uh the ruach kodesh taught than any seminary in the entire world so there's nothing that those seminary those seminaries can teach anybody that's in this walk can teach those seminaries lots of things that they don't know. Okay, so anyway, I've gone through that story, basically, and uh, I guess now we'll go ahead and uh, start in our study of Jeremiah. In, here in the study of Jeremiah today, uh, we're going to see some things that are, <clears throat> I'm not going to say profound, but it's really cool stuff, and uh, so let's, uh, let's go to Jeremiah. Uh, let's see, 28. Okay, just in continuing in our study of Jeremiah, it says, in the fifth month of the same year, the fourth year, near the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah of Yehuda, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, who was from Gibeon, said to me in the house of Yahuwah, in the presence of the priest and all the people, this is what Yahuwah, Sabuot, the Elohim of Israel said, I have broke the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will restore to this place all the articles of the house of Yahuwah that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and carried to Babylon. And I will restore to this place Yechaniah, son of Yehoiakim, king of Yehuda along with all the exiles from Yehuda and went to Babylon, declares Yahuwah, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, what you have to understand is Hananiah was not sent, the prophet Hananiah was not sent by Yahuwah to deliver this message. So he's saying that Yahuwah told him. Now, when you do things like this, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, big failure. So if you say that Yahuwah said something and he didn't say it, then basically you're, well, you're, you're, you're calling something uh, bad. You're calling something bad good. In other words, you're calling something that Yahuwah didn't say something that Yahuwah did say. So you're, you're a false prophet. But when you say that, so when you, when you look at the word good, you know that it's of Yahuwah. Now, when I say bad, it means it's not of Yahuwah. So they're taking something that's not of Yahuwah and saying that it is of Yahuwah. So anyway, Hananiah is, he's digging himself a hole and he's fixing to be covered up in his own hole. So uh, he, Jeremiah is listening to this, and here's what he said. He said, then the prophet Jer Jeremiah replied to the pop prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priest and all the people who were standing in the house of Yahuwah. Jeremiah said here, amen. May Yahuwah do so. Uh, may Yahuwah fulfill the words you have prophesied, and may he restore the articles of his house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. So what Jeremiah is doing is he's just kind of, I think he's more or less playing with Hananiah because Jeremiah knows better. And he just doesn't want to get in an argument, I guess, or whatever. And he's just letting him kind of, he's giving him rope, letting him hang himself, basically. Nevertheless, listen now to this message I'm speaking in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets and the old uh, who, precede, who precede you, 
and me prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many lands and great nations. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, only if the word of the prophet comes true will the prophet be recognized as one Yahuwah has truly sent. So here, Jeremiah is basically giving them the, uh, the definition of one of Yahuwah's prophets. Only if it comes true. Or you, so if, if, if it doesn't come true, then the prophet is not a prophet of Yahuwah. He's basically a liar. Okay. Uh, then, in the pres or then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of Jeremiah, the prophet, and broke it. And in the presence of the people, Hananiah proclaimed, this is what Yahuwah says. In this way, within two years, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of all the nations. At this, Jeremiah the prophet went on his way. But shortly after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off his neck, the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah. So Jeremiah left and Yahuwah stopped him and says, look, I want to tell you something. It says, go tell Hananiah, Hananiah that this is what Yahuwah says. You have broken the yoke of wood, but in its place you have fastened a yoke of iron. For this is what Yahuwah Sabuot, the Elohim of Israel, says. I have put the yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations to make them serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. I have even given him control of the beasts of the field. So here, Nebuchadnezzar, Yahuwah is just telling Jeremiah that Nebuchadnezzar is an instrument of Yahuwah. Even though Nebuchadnezzar is considered the most evil king that's ever been over the nation of Israel, he is an instrument of Yahuwah. Just like Hasatan is nothing more than an instrument of Yahuwah. The devil can do nothing unless Yahuwah allows him or makes him do it. And here Nebuchadnezzar is just doing, Nebuchadnezzar is the tool that, you, that Yahuwah uses to uh, punish the nation of Israel for their stiff neck and for their disobedience. <clears throat> Just like right now, I think the, the world is Babylon and our leadership is Nebuchadnezzar. And I believe that everything that we're going through, all the hardships, all the the calamity and the wars and everything, I believe are instruments that Yahuwah is using to punish us for being disobedient, okay? It says, then the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, Yahuwah did not send you, but you have persuaded this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, this is what Yahuwah says, I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. You will die this year because you have preached rebellion against Yahuwah. And in the seventh month of that year, very year, the prophet Hananiah died. Okay, so when, you know, when Hananiah is standing in the, in the way of Yahuwah, and he's actually teaching the people to be disobedient to Yahuwah, then he's going to take him, he took him out of the way. Now, you know, one of the things we need to be careful about, when Yahuwah is doing something, and I, let me give you this, I'll give you this example now. In the last presidential election, I know that there was a, uh, you know, it's still being contested and it's still being, you know, there's still a lot of confusion about what happened. Was the, you know, was the votes, uh, you know, were they, uh, well, they, you know, were some of the votes not counted or a lot of the votes not counted or a lot of extra votes made? It doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter at all. What we need to do is to just accept it the way it is because however it ended up is how Yahuwah wants it to be. In fact, the president that we have right now, people may not like him. And I know that he's, I mean, uh, gas prices, food prices, uh, everything has skyrocketed. And that's all a judgment against us. Yahuwah put him where he wants him and he's done it because of our disobedience. And so, you know, we need to accept it. Romans chapter 13, you can read it. And I think it's also in, uh, I'm not mistaken, either first or second Corinthians, but it's, and it's actually in the book of Jeremiah also. There's several places that talk about 
if you go against your ruling authorities, you're going against Yahuwah because Yahuwah put those people in place when, you know, to, to get done whatever he needs done. And so, you know, you, you like the president or you don't like the president. Here's my, here's my stance. I don't care. I don't care who's president. I don't care if we don't have a president because that's in the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of the world is going to do what the kingdom of the world wants to do. Uh, whatever Yahuwah does, just don't get in his way. And one of, the way, one of the ways you know that you can get in his way is if you, if you vote and you vote against who wins. If, because the winner is chosen by Yahuwah. Well, you know, if you vote and let's say that, that I mean, I know a lot of people's not going to want to hear this, but if you voted for Donald Trump on this last presidential election, you voted against Yahuwah. I mean, you know, he seemed to a lot of people like the better choice of the two. But the thing is, Donald Trump wouldn't have gotten the world or the United States to a position that Yahuwah needs it to be or wants it to be. Uh, Joe Biden, on the other hand, is getting the United States positioned where Yahuwah wants the United States to be and the world to be. Since we're a world power, then Yahuwah has gotten these government leaders to the position in order to get the world, get the United States in the position that it needs to be. So read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not, I mean, it's not a happy place. Uh, it's going to be, you know, and for the book of Revelation to come true, for those prophets, the, the, for John, the prophecy that, that Yahuwah gave John to come true, then it's got to be bad stuff. It's got to be stuff that it's going to, it's going to be not fun to live through. It's going to be, it's going to be really rough. Well, he put the people in place for, to make that happen. So I know that, you know, uh, the same thing is going on here with Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Judah. What Yahuwah told Jeremiah to tell the people is <clears throat> surrender. Do what Nebuchadnezzar tells you to do. Go into the land. And here, this next chapter, I think we'll see this. But it says, you know, plant crops. Uh, you know, be part of the system. Uh, have kids and grandkids. Give your sons to, to daughter, you know, to, to, you know, other men's daughters. And give your daughters to other men's sons. And, and you know, live your life and prosper, okay? If you surrender, you, you'll go and you will be part of the remnant that Yahuwah will eventually call back. And that's what he's doing right now. He's calling people out of these places. He's calling people out of the United States. He's calling people out of, you know, all over the world. And when I say he's calling them out, you know, we are part of that lost, the lost tribes of Israel. And he's calling us out. And, and, and this call is a spiritual call. And he'll call us out. He'll call us out of Babylon, just like he's so just like he's going to call these people out of Babylon back to Israel, he's calling us out of Babylon back to the spiritual Israel. And the spiritual Israel is those that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith in Yahushua the Messiah. You can read that in Jeremiah 31. We're, we'll get to it here next week or the week after. And you can also read it in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And so he's going to, he's going to, you know, the, the new covenant is what I'm talking about. And that new covenant is to the house of Israel and to the house of Yehuda. It's not to the house of the Gentiles or the going. Okay, now, Jeremiah 29, starting in verse one. <clears throat> this is the text of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent to Jerusalem to the surviving elders along uh, among the exiles and to the priests and the prophets and all other uh, ne all others Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Yechani, the, the queen mother, the court officials, the officials of Yehuda and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metalsmiths had been exiled from Jerusalem. So all of those people had been exiled to Babylon uh, out of Jerusalem or Yehuda. It says the letter was entrusted to uh, Elisha or Elisha, son of Saphan, and 
Gomorrah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Yehuda, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It stated, this is what Yahuwah Savuot, the Elohim of Israel, says to all the exiles who were carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives uh, for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may too have sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Seek the prosperity of the city to which I have sent you as exiles. Pray to Yahuwah on its behalf, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. Okay, this is where we are right now. He's telling us to, you know, to, to live in the world. You know, come, I mean, that's where we are. We are in the world. Uh, just, you know, live life, do whatever we have to. But at the same time, we need to recognize Yahuwah as being the creator and his son as being our Messiah. Okay, for this is what Yahuwah Savuot, the Elohim of Israel says, do not be deceived by the prophets and the diviners among you. That's really strange. Now, who are the prophets and the diviners among us? Well, it's basically the Christian preachers. Okay, and do not listen to the dreams you elicit from them for they are falsely prophesying to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares Yahuwah. So when you hear a modern day preacher, pastor, prophet, whatever, when you hear them talking and saying things like, uh, the Torah has been done away with, it's been fulfilled, so we don't have to follow it, that Yahushua fulfilled it for us, and now well, we can, you know, we can do, we can live life, we can do whatever we want, we don't have to follow the Torah, those people are not sent by Yahuwah, okay? You need, to, you need to recognize this. The same thing happened to the people there in Babylon. It's, it's happening to us here today. It's been going on ever since. Okay, for this is what Yahuwah says. When Babylon's 70 years are complete, I will attend to you and confirm my promise to restore you to this place. Okay, now, when their 70 years are complete, now, I'm not sure how long it's been since Babylon. I haven't done the math. I should have done this, but I didn't. But now, how long has it been since the Babylonian exile? Has it been, has it been 70, uh, 70 jubilees? That, that's been, what, 3,500 years? Is that about right? I don't know. I have to go back and do the math. But So seven, what's 70 50s? Is that, has it been, have we lived here on this earth for, uh, that, that's a good, you know, that's a good something to look up. So uh, from that time to this, or maybe from, you know, from the time, uh, I don't know, but I bet if you do the math, we're at the 70th something, the 70th Jubilee or the, the 70th uh, cycle of some kind. Because right now, he's calling people out of Babylon, just like what he's fixing to tell us here. It says, uh, verse 11, it's for, for I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahuwah, plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Okay, that's what we have done. We have got on our knees. We've asked Yahuwah to show us the truth. You know, don't care what the truth is. Just please show us. And it goes on in 14. It says, I will be, I will be found by you, declares Yahuwah, and I will restore you from captivity and gather you to all, from all the nations and places to which I have banished you, declares Yahuwah. I will restore you to the place from which I sent you into exile. We are in exile because he sent us where we are. He sent us to this place and now he is calling us out. We, are, we have searched for him, we have found him, now he's calling us out. This place is Babylon, we have left Babylon. When we have left the kingdom of the world, in other words, when our heart no longer cares what the kingdom of the world does and you don't care what is going on you know, with the political stuff, 
then and you're more concerned with what Yahuwah is doing and, and focusing on his way of doing things, you have left the kingdom of the world and now we're in the kingdom of Yahuwah. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, we just need to, we need to, to, to separate ourselves from as much of this problem as we can. But still, we need to live our life. We got to live here. So we got to live our life. We got to do the best we can. And he wants us to prosper. He wants us to, and, and when I say prosper, I'm not talking about the, the prosperity theology that a lot of the modern day preachers are preaching. Uh, I'm not talking about getting rich. I'm talking about having what you need and being content with what you have. Well, if you have nothing, be content with what you have. That's the whole key to being happy. Now, if you're looking at the neighbor and you see he's driving a new car and you want a new car or, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff, I mean, you know, there's times that we need to buy a new car. Don't get me wrong, but that shouldn't be our focus. The car needs to be a tool. It needs to be a way to get to where we need to be. But I mean, you know, I drove a car for many years without air conditioning and, you know, I wanted a car with air conditioning and I finally got one. Well, I've been trying to keep one with air conditioning, but the thing is we need to be content if that's where we are, if we don't have it. And so long story short, we need to be more focused on Yahuwah's way of doing things than it is being focused on the, the kingdom of the world. Uh, let's see. Because you may say Yahuwah has raised up for us prophets in Babylon. This is what Yahuwah says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in the city, your brothers who did not go with you into exile. This is what Yahuwah Tavuot says. Okay, I will send against them sword and famine and plague, and I will make them like rotten figs, so bad they cannot be eaten. Now, okay, so there, there was a group that went into Babylon they're going to be taken care of. Yahuwah's going to watch over them. There's a group that didn't go. And this is who he's talking about. Those who refused to go that fought. Yahuwah made the statement earlier that if you resist and fight, then you're going to die. You're going to have a, you're going to have a hard life. You're going to die of the plagues or by the sword. And that's what he's saying. He's going to send them, uh, pretty much send them calamity. I will pursue them with the sword and famine and plague, and I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, a curse, a desolation, and an object of scorn and reproach among all the nations to which I banish them. I will do this because they have not listened to my words, declared Yahuwah, which I sent to them again and again through the servants, the prophets, and neither have you exiles listened declares Yahuwah. all right now so when it's when he speaks of there in verse 18 he speaks of a desolation well it could be a physical desolation but the desolation that we need to be concerned about is the desolation where Yahuwah turns his back on you now if you're one of the false prophets then Yahuwah is going to make you a desolation he's going to turn his back on you and so you need to figure out uh the way to follow Yahuwah, to make him happy. And the way to do that is to follow his word because it says right there in verse 19, I will do this because they have not listened to my words. My words there, that is the Torah. Okay, they didn't listen to the Torah. The, and then in John chapter one, it talks about that Torah, that words of Yahuwah was made flesh and he dwelt among us. That is the Messiah. Now, the Messiah did not change any of those words. He is the living word of Yahuwah. So though when the Messiah came along, he didn't change any of the Torah. He tells you that in Matthew chapter 5. So anyway, he didn't come to change the law. He came to, to fulfill it, but not from the standpoint of doing away with it or ending it or not having us follow it. That's not what he's talking about. He brought it to the, its fullness is what it amounts to. And so he being the living Torah, he was, he is what we keep our sights on. Okay. He is what the way he lived is what the way we 
should strive to live. So hear the word of Yahuwah, all you exiles. I have sent uh, away from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what Yahuwah, Savuot, the Elohim of Israel, says about Ahab, son of Kali, and Zedekiah, son of Maaseh, yeah, Maaseh, who are prophesying to you lies in my name. I will deliver them to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will kill them before your very eyes. Because of them, all the exiles of Judah uh, who are in Babylon will use this curse. May Yahuwah make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. For they have committed an outrage in Israel and committing adultery with the wives of the neighbors and speaking lies in my name, which I do not command them to do. I am he who knows, and I am a witness, declares Yahuwah. Okay. You are to tell Shemai, the Nehalamite, the Nehalamite, ne the Nalamite, okay, he that, uh, that this is what Yahuwah Sabuo, the Elohim of Israel, says in your name or in your own name, you have sent out letters to all the people of Jerusalem, to the priest uh, Zeph to the priest Zephaniah, son of Maaseh, Maaseh, and to all the priests, uh, you said to Zephaniah, let's see. Okay, Yahuwah has appointed you priest in place of Yehoda. Now, I want, I want to stop right there just a minute. This is a pretty interesting word. So if you just see the, the word Yehoda or Jehoda, however you want to say it, that is spelt yod hey wah hey dalit ayin It contains the word the name of Yahuwah, the yod hey wah hey So the pronunciation of that would be yahuwah da yahuwah da okay? So it contains the, na the name of Yahuwah, the full name of Yahuwah. A lot of names in the scripture doesn't contain the full yod hey wah hey but that name does. Okay, to be the chief officer in the house of Yahuwah, responsible for any madman who acts like a prophet, you must put him in stocks and neck irons. So now, why do you not rebuke Jeremiah of Anathoth, who poses as a prophet among you? For he has sent us into Babylon, claiming since the exile will be lengthy, uh, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Zephaniah the priest, however, had read this letter to Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah, send a message telling all the exiles that Yahuwah says concerning Shemai, the Nephilite, because Shemai has prophesied to you, though I did not send him and has made you trust in a lie. This is what Yahuwah says. I will surely punish Shemai, the Nephilite, the Nahalite, and his descendants, and he will have uh, no one left among his people, nor will he see the good that I will bring to my people, declares Yahuwah, for he has preached rebellion against Yahuwah. So this, you know, here, Jeremiah is just, he's, Jeremiah brought the message that the king of Babylon is going to be there for 70 years. They're going to be under the Nebuchadnezzar's rule for 70 years. And this, you know, these, these, False prophets are saying that Yahuwah is going to break the, the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar and they're all going to get to come back to, to Yehuda, to Judah. And it's not the case. They, those prophets are not the prophets of Yahuwah. So when you, if you want to prophesy, make sure that Yahuwah is telling you what to say. And the best way to do that is it has to follow what the scripture says. So we know that the scripture has uh, prophecies in it. If you prophesy and it violates one of the prophecies that's in the scripture, then you're not a prophet of Yahuwah. And this is what they're doing. They're prophesying against the prophet of Yahuwah. 
And so Yahuwah is going to put, he's going to take them out of the way. They're not going to be around long. And so, you know, it's, uh, uh, I know if, if we were, if we would have been people at that time, it would have been hard to know who was telling the truth. It, it would have been hard for us to determine, well, is Jeremiah telling the truth or is these other prophets, are they telling the truth? And I mean, I put myself kind of in their position and I really feel for them because they really didn't know. Now, uh, you know, once they started seeing the prophets, the false prophets die because, you know, he, you started taking them out of the way, then you might think, well, maybe Jeremiah is the one we need to listen to. And I think, you know, hopefully the people listened to Jeremiah. I know a lot of them did because they did give up. They did go into Babylon. They did prosper. They raised families, had gardens, raised families, you know, did everything right. And they prospered. And uh, but so and that's where we are today. We're we are where we are because those people uh, did what they did. And so now it's our turn to turn back to Yahuwah to seek him with our whole heart and for us to be called out of Babylon and for us to be called out of Babylon, then we need to hear the call. And for that, for us to hear that call, you have to be in the Torah. You have to, you have to be studying and, and understanding, which I mean, doing the Torah, because if you're not, you'll never see this stuff. You'll never see what Yahuwah, uh, is uh you'll never see what he's doing he uh he put all this together to understand the book of revelation you have to also understand the torah the old testament the, the prophets uh daniel ezekiel isaiah there's there's all the old prophets i mean they're, they're they all tie together to make the book of revelation what it is and so to to, to read any of the New Testament and to have a theology based on nothing but the New Testament is, is going to be skewed. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be the way that it, it, you're not going to see what you need to see just by reading the New Testament. You can't, you can't get it out because it's, unless you who is just, unless it's a miracle and he wants to show it to you. Now, when he shows it to you, for you to understand who the Messiah is, you have to understand what the Torah is because he is the living Torah, okay? All right, so uh, I don't know. We've, uh, oh, yeah, we're a little over an hour, I think, looking at the time. And uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it off right here. And again, I wanna thank all of you for watching the video. I wanna thank you for those that are here and i hope you're in the process of somewhere either have already observed passover or in the process of observing passover uh, depending on what calendar you're using what you're looking at and so anyway i hope that uh, i hope that you're that you're doing the best you can at following yahuwah's moedim and all that uh, that you know that he has put together so uh, i guess uh, with that, uh, we'll try to get a, a recording later on when we start our Seder and as we go through the Seder. It's, it's going to be a very abbreviated Seder. I know I was watching one the other night, last night on TV, it was a, a Messianic Jewish congregation. And I mean, it lasted for hours, which that's a lot of the Seders do. Now, ours is going to be very abbreviated. We're only going to do basically what the scripture says to do. We're not going to add a bunch of stuff to it. And so uh, all that stuff is traditional. It's uh, Jewish, rabbinical Jewish tradition, and we're not going to add anything like that to our Seder. But uh, the main thing on the Seder is to recognize Yahusha and all that he has done and the calling, him calling us out of Israel, or I'm sorry, out of Egypt or Babylon being the same. So anyway, I'll say Shabbat Shalom, and we'll see you later on, and next Shabbat, Yahuwah willing. Thank you very much.